Mr. Speaker, in today's debate, the government passed strongly believes that both security and the protection of liberties are important for sustaining a secure, functional society. But this debate is about setting priorities of which value takes precedent over the other. And why is that? Because inherently, these two values very often contradict each other. And it's often the case that the more freedom you have, the less security there is, and vice versa. The more security you have, you get less freedom in return. So essentially, we want to make this debate about which value a national government necessarily has to prioritize more. And we think that it should be security because freedom comes with the cost. Now, as the Prime Minister, I'd like to define some key terms in today's motion before we present our case. Firstly, security will be referred to national security and all subsequent administrative and legislative measures to protect the nation. And this includes the military service or laws that directly blast with the civil liberties, such as the Patriot Act in the U.S., which allows for the government to engage in wiretapping and checking the civilians' emails. It also includes the laws like the National Security Act in Korea, which surpasses the rights of free speech and the association. And second, the protection of civil liberties will be referred to allowing the full exercise of a fundamental rights such as the free speech, freedom of association, privacy, and etc. And thirdly, we would like to define this house as the liberal democracies for two main reasons. First, we think that liberal democracies have attained a certain balance between both values, which makes it contentious to which value they should, they should prioritize for. And secondly, we think that these are the countries that have the check and balance system to effectively prevent abuse and redress if there are any. So without further ado, I'd like to present our case. The government badge will provide you with three arguments, four arguments in total, and the first two, which are the principal arguments and Protection of many over the few will be covered by myself. So the first reason why we think a national government necessarily has to prioritize the national security over civil liberty is because the protection of civil liberties can only be guaranteed by having security. That without national security, it is impossible to exercise the rights to civil liberties. Now take the example of a war or time of chaos. Without stability or order, the people are deprived of the secure environment that is prerequisite and preconditioned to realizing their civil rights. So take the Patriot Act or the National Security Act. While these laws do limit some aspects of the civil liberties, these laws are essential in fighting against the threats to a nation. And military service is also a strong form of limiting people's rights to movement. But through this policy, we protect the nation and in consequence safeguard the lives of millions of people no, sir. People and their associated rights. So in essence, we think that security must be prioritized because without it, liberty would be meaningless. Now the second reason why we think that security should be prioritized more is because the government necessarily has to, has to prioritize the protection, the protection of many over the few. So in other words, the government needs to apply the utilitarian calculus mm -hmm. in an attempt to protect as many people's rights and even if it means sacrifice of a li liberties of a few. So take the example of a possible nuclear threat by a terrorist organization. If we have a terrorist who has planted a bomb in the middle of a city that will result in millions of deaths, then the government is justified to engage in interrogation, uh, a, forceful, a forceful one. And why is that? Because one individual civil liberties can never supersede the millions of people's lives right to live. So for so what have I told you in today in our debate? We told you that national government necessarily has to prioritize the national security over civil liberties because without the civil liberties without the national security civil liberties becomes meaningless and we have to protect the many over the few. So for this reason we're more than happy to propose. Speakers move for four minutes and 17 seconds. DPA. No. Thank you. 
government bench. I'll be presenting two additional points of contention, which I will explain later. First, I would like first like to rebut to the previous speaker. The leader of opposition <coughs> stated that freedom is the goal of society. But we agree that freedom is central to society, but freedom is never free, but needs to earn. <coughs> South Korea is a free country only because our forefathers sacrificed their lives and freedom to fight against North Korea during the Korean War. In other words, they fought for freedom. Therefore, the opposition is wrong to assume that freedom does not entail sacrifices. Secondly, people are never able to feel free if they feel they are under threat. In other words, freedom comes when people know they are safe <coughs> or they will not use it. Moreover, it is never possible to exercise freedom if someone else is hurting me or attacking me. That is why freedom only comes after there is some level of security. And <coughs> he also stated that this policy might lead to government tyranny. That is exactly our point. There is no meaning in having freedom if there is no security. Because security not only means security from external threats, but also security from your own government. Only when there are certain laws to prevent governmental abuse, can citizens engage in freedom freely. Secondly, there is no point in having freedom if we are the slaves of others. What information? Now, I'd like to move to our team's case. So to our team's third argument, there are three characteristics of threats that render it necessary to prioritize national security or civil liberties. The first is that threats never disappear. Mr. Speaker, threats toward the nation always exist, which is why the government always needs to be ready to counter the possible threats. For example, there, uh, take Korea for example, there is a constant threat from North Korea, which makes it necessary to conserve citizens. There are North Korean spies <coughs> and anti-government groups that make it necessary to impose restrictions on free speech through the National Security Act. Because these threats don't disappear, the government always needs to set limits on civil liberties to effectively arrest the threats in question. Yes. How does your model guarantee that we can actually fight against these potential threats where we, can, where we can't even see those threats? Uh, I, that is exactly why we have to actually restrict the freedom of speech or those freedoms to actually email tap and phone tap. For example, take Bin Laden, for example, we caught them near a Pakistan military base, and that was because we phone tap and email tap the civilians, civilians emails and no. phones. That is because uh, this proves that our policy can be effective, and this proves our point. And the second nature of threats is that there is no certainty as to when the enemy or an enemy will strike. And because of this exact reason, the government needs to prioritize this general security all the time. The third and probably the most critical reason is that the infrastructure of protecting civil liberties becomes most vulnerable when the government does not prioritize national security. Take America, for example. Many American politicians have pointed out the, that the 9 11 terrorist attacks could have been easily prevented if they just had implemented certain se security safeguard measures, which were opposed by the American public because they simply thought it was inconvenient. So in conclusion, the main reason as to why the government needs to prioritize security over liberty is because of the very fact that there is a constant threat to national security, which, if infiltrated, will jeopardize the protection of civil liberties. So to our next argument, the increasing threat of 21st century, Mr. Speaker, is terrorism. Not only is it difficult to track them down, they hide themselves in the midst of the public by wearing civilian clothes. They don't abide by the rules of war and even attack civilians indiscriminately. This new form of threat has made it difficult to fight in a conventional way. That is why it is necessary to sometimes engage in phone tapping or email tapping to effectively deter them. That is why prioritizing civil liberties will jeopardize the war against terror because the only way to catch them would be by bending civil liberties. Therefore, our team probably proposed that. Speakers will perform minutes and 22 seconds.
Mr. Speaker, in today's debate, Team Opposition told us that somehow the protection of liberties can provide everyone happiness. Happiness, but we see that without any life, the liberty and happiness and satisfactory life cannot be guaranteed, which is why we say that security is necessary for the individual satisfactory life, but not liberty. And I'll be proving more closely as to why this is in two main clashes, which is first, government duty, and second, effectiveness of security. Now let's move on to the first clash of government duty. The team opposition has this idea that the government duty is to provide people with liberty. But we said that first of all, it's not because it's the reason why society was formed, the reason why the citizens lived under the king was that they wanted protection from all those robberies, from all those dangers. So we said that there is a social contract that the government needs to provide protection for the citizens while the citizens provide their liberties and taxes in return. So we say that the whole purpose of society is security. But let's say even if, we say that even if that's the case, we say that security is a prerequisite of liberty because in times of chaos and war, liberty does not exist because the government is just taking away everyone's rights and just putting them into military to actually save lives. In those cases, security becomes prioritized. So we say that Sorry. Consistent security, the security that always exists, can actually lessen and prevent those damages from chaos or war. Because, ladies and gentlemen, we told you that threats are hard to detect, always exist, and evolve, and is always evolving. And without security, the government becomes vulnerable to danger. Sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Your ideas are only under the assumption that the one government does is always right. When government does some things, for, let's say, for war, it can be wrong, like Iraq war. How does that um, part? So your arguments can only be true when governments actually do 100% perfect job in protecting national security. Well, we say that even though the government doesn't do a perfect job, as our prime minister defined this motion, in democratic, in liberal democratic societies, there are checks and balance systems that can actually prevent the government from drifting off to government tyranny. Because, ladies and gentlemen, we told you that security is actually the protection of the citizens from the government itself. We said security can prevent those dangers, prevent those mistakes from government from happening. Well, then the team opposition questioned the effectiveness of security. Now, I'll deal with this in my class. We told you that terrorism is hard to detect because there were, the terrorists are wearing civilian clothes and always trying to hide within the public. We said national security, email tapping, Patriot Act is all necessary to catch and even deter those terrorists from happening. Consider Guantanamo Bay. Through Guantanamo Bay, the government, the United States government was able to find Bin Laden, who was right next to, it's, it's over three minutes, who was right next to Britain to prove the military. And the Britain military could not find it. While the go United States government could, through the measures of security, that team proposition is very, very supportive for. And then we provided you with the example of 9-1-1 terror, of how to secure, when the United States government actually prioritized security over liberty after the 9-11 terror, there was no concrete terrors. The government, the United States government, actually cast those guys. At 2008, January 11, the United States government found a pipe bomb that was implemented by the terrorists. Without the United States government prioritizing of security, this wouldn't have been found and this would have led to millions of deaths. Well, we say that security isn't effective, it's effective in terms of finding and deterring those and crimes, and you provide concrete evidences to support this. So at the end of the day, we realized the government duty is to prioritize security over liberty. And we told you that the security is effective in terms of saving lives and in terms of matching into the utilitarian calculus, which makes us more than happy to propose. Thank you. Speakers hold for four minutes and 14 seconds. Governor reply. Mr. Speaker, today the opposition said that we the government is violating one's liberty, which is in fact a total of nonsense in this debate. Therefore, we would like to say that people can be in freedom once they have security, and moreover, we can prevent possible threats. 
Well, I see two flaws and um, two burdens today in the opposition case. First, they, first, they did not prove why liberty is such an important aspect in today's debate. The government perfectly proved that people can't have the liberty or freedom once they are under the safety. This basically means that the government should apply national security in order to allow people for meaningful life. Moreover, by using the utilitarian, utilitarian calculus, you can give numerous benefits for millions of people. However, here the opposition totally misunderstood our government point that people cannot get the liberty because of the government only prioritizing national security in order to allow people national security. But think about it. How can these people actually gain freedom once they are not living? If the government does not develop that their national security, many people will lose their lives due to the people called terrorists. They not only had flaws in trying to kill so many people, but actually gave contradictory points to their own logic. Well, the second burden I found in the opposition case was that they didn't realize the existing threats. Our policy can actually be very beneficial for many people. We would like to emphasize the point of existing threats. There are many incidents that occur due to terrorists. The 9 terror happened due to the fact that the U.S. government was not considering national security as an effective solution. But they only give such lacking points by understanding our argument. Is the opposition just going to leave this serious situation and watch? Our policy may be not so sudden, but it can at least solve this, this problem in a constant way. Another mistake that the opposition uh, made in this debate was that the, they create was was that that they explained about the government tyranny. They first of all lacked elaboration by only providing tons of examples like Adolf Hitler. Um, so we would like to respond that this security comes that that this security comes from your own government and that security leads to liberty. As a result, we would like to once again state that we can never trust the ir irresponsible opposition that, that is just, that never, never prove how their approach will be effective with, with creating faulty assumptions in their own point. Thank you.